The next concept that divides collectivism from individualism is group supremacy. Collectivism is based on the belief that the group is more important than the individual. According to this view, the group is an entity of its own and it has rights of its own. Furthermore, those rights are more important than individual rights. Therefore, it is acceptable to sacrifice individuals if necessary for the greater good of the greater number. Who can object to the loss of liberty if it is justified as necessary for the greater good of society? The ultimate group is, of course, the state. Therefore, the state is more important than individual citizens, and it is acceptable to sacrifice individuals, if necessary, for the benefit of the state. This concept is at the heart of all modern totalitarian systems, built on the model of collectivism. Individualists, on the other hand, argue that there is no such thing as a group. You can't touch a group, you can't see a group. All you can touch and see are individuals. The word group is an abstraction that does not exist as a tangible reality. It's like the abstraction called a forest. Forests do not exist. Only trees exist. Forest is the concept of many trees. Likewise, the word group merely describes the abstract concept of many individuals. Only individuals are real, and therefore, there is no such thing as group rights. Only individuals have rights. Just because there are many individuals in one group and only a few in another does not give a higher priority to the individuals in the larger group, even if you call it the state. A majority of voters do not have more rights than the minority. Rights are not derived from the power of numbers. They do not come from the group. They are intrinsic with each human being. When someone argues that individuals must be sacrificed for the greater good of society, what they are really saying is that some individuals are to be sacrificed for the greater good of other individuals. The morality of collectivism is based on numbers. Anything may be done so long as the number of people benefiting is supposedly greater than the number of people being sacrificed. I say supposedly because, in the real world, those who decide who is to be sacrificed don't count fairly. Dictators always claim that they represent the greater good of the greater number, but in reality, they and their support organizations usually comprise less than 1% of the population. The theory is that someone has to speak for the masses and represent their best interest because they are too dumb to figure it out for themselves. So collectivist leaders, wise and virtuous as they are, make decisions for them. In this way, it is possible to explain any atrocity or injustice as a necessary measure for the greater good of society. Modern totalitarians always parade themselves as humanitarians. Because individuals do not accept group supremacy, collectivists often portray them as being selfish and insensitive to the needs of others. That theme is common in schools today. If a child is not willing to go along with the group, he is criticized as being socially disruptive and not a good team player or a good citizen. But individualism is not based on ego. It is based on principle. If you accept the premise that individuals may be sacrificed for the group, you have made a large mistake on two counts. First, individuals are the essence of the group, which means the group is being sacrificed anyway, piece by piece. Secondly, the underlying principle is deadly. Today, the individual being sacrificed may be unknown to you or even someone you dislike. Tomorrow, it could be you. It takes but a moment's reflection to realize that the greater good of the greater number is not achieved by sacrificing individuals, but by protecting individuals. Society is best served by individualism, not collectivism. We are dealing here with one of the reasons that people make a distinction between republics and democracies. In recent years, we have been taught to believe that a democracy is the ideal form of government. Supposedly, that is what was created by the American Constitution. But, closer examination of the documents and the speech transcripts of the men who wrote the Constitution, you find that they spoke very poorly of democracy. They said in plain words that a democracy was one of the worst possible forms of government, and so they created what they called a republic. That is why the word democracy doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution, and when Americans pledge allegiance to the flag, it is to the republic for which it stands, not the democracy. The reason this is important is that the difference between a democracy and a republic is the difference between collectivism and individualism. In a pure democracy, the majority rules. Consider a lynch mob. There is only one person with a dissenting vote, and he is at the end of a rope. That 
is pure democracy in action. A republic is a government based on the principle of limited majority rule, so that the minority, even a minority of one, will be protected from the whims and passions of the majority. Republics are often characterized by written constitutions that spell out the rules that make that possible. That was the function of the American Bill of Rights, which is nothing more than a list of things that the government may not do. It says that Congress, even though it represents the majority, shall pass no law denying the minority their rights to free exercise of religion, freedom of speech, peaceful assembly, the right to bear arms, and other unalienable rights. These limitations on majority rule are the essence of a republic, and they are also at the core of the ideology called individualism. There is another major difference between these two concepts. Collectivism on the one hand, supporting any government action so long as it can be said to be for the greater good of the greater number, and individualism on the other hand, defending the rights of the minority against the passions and greed of the majority. In the next part of this series, we look to the divide over coercion versus freedom. We will examine the collectivist morality that justifies the use of force to deprive individuals from private property, if it is for charitable reasons, and the individualist morality that believes that voluntary actions are at the core of the term charity.